Tonight really is about naming an imbalance uh, that we have, which currently serves or poses uh, indeed as a mainstream dialogue around femininity. So everything that we are exposed to in our media in terms of image making, whether it would be, be film or stills or commentary, uh, is quite often coming for a from a place that is a projection of femininity and so what is interesting I think for us to talk about is whether there's a difference um, and whether an authentic construction of femininity serves us very differently. So uh, I know that you will have read already the biogs on our esteemed panellists. There's far too many awards between them for me to start reading them all out. But I um, am delighted to, to chat to everyone. And I'm just going to ask everybody, really, to start off by talking about their aesthetic, um, what, what, how they go about things. So, Catherine, I'm going to start with you at that end. And we'll work our way down, I think, because it makes sense to maybe pass the microphone um, between you three and then hear the same. Thanks, Karen. Um, my aesthetic, well, I think my aesthetic has changed an awful lot in the last couple of years. Um, I think that uh, I, mean, I actually went back to college and did a master's in um, visual communication a couple of years ago, and I think prior to that, the films that I was making were very aesthetically driven and not much else, to be honest. There, it was definitely all about the visual, and I think from doing my master's, I really started to think about putting um, stories into my work and um, more of an narrative structure and thinking about what it was I was trying to say. So I think the aesthetic has become less important and it's more for me now about the message behind my work. So I, I think my aesthetic's a bit all over the place and I'm trying to work out where it is, but I think the main um, push, pushing um, process in the work is um, trying to communicate ideas and a lot of them seem at the minute to be around femininity and um, feminism. That's me. So I'll pass it on to Ruth. Great. So Ruth, let's hear from you. Hello. Um, I'm not quite sure what my aesthetic is. I guess I always try and feel something when I'm making a film, when I'm behind the camera or editing. Trying to understand what my vision of beauty is, I guess. But it's definitely, I have to feel something and believe in something. And I tend not to really have, I don't, I don't know if I have that aesthetic. Well, it sounds like you do to me. That's a, that's a good working aesthetic. Um, let's hear from you, Sarah. Hi. Um, I did the head shaving film, and I haven't made that many films yet, but I would say my aesthetic is just striving to represent a more um, alternative girl in a, yeah, in the society. <laughs> And um, I'll just pick up on that. Why? Why? Um, I think it's because that's the kind of girl that inspires me and the kind of girl that I relate to. And um, I don't know, I don't feel like I'm making work necessarily for a mainstream audience. I feel like it's maybe a bit more niche or meant to inspire people who maybe feel like they don't fit into the status quo. So I pick up on those girls and I, I want to represent them. Okay, thank you. And uh, Maria? Um, yeah, I haven't really thought that much about my aesthetics either, but I think it's much clearer for me what I like, and I think that obviously feeds back in my aesthetic. And I like things that are very surreal and abstract, but especially things that have double meanings and things that are not clearly defined. And I think every time when I put together a film, when I realize there's something that could mean different things to different people, that's what I really like. So um, I grew up with four brothers, so I watched all the James Bond films by the age of about 13. And it was always, I remember James Bond, there was like always the nice, beautiful girl who was a love interest, and then there was the other girl who was evil, but she was also sort of sexy, and, and that was also the woman that I liked. So I think that's sort of, she's like Grace Jones in A Beauty Kill, that's why I said it. <laughs> We're loving it, it's working for us. Amanda? Um, I, I'm a work, I work predominantly as a television director, um, so everything comes from a story, and I think the aesthetic changes depending on what the story is. Uh, with skirt, it was very much about the aesthetic just of everyday objects. Um, and with regards to the wider conversation about kind of gender, I think, I mean, casting is really important to me, but with that film, it was very much about uh, having two characters where you didn't have any dialogue um, or much story, so you're trying to work out 
from what they were wearing and what they looked like, who they were. So um, I think the aesthetic of kind of who I chose came from that. But similarly, I think, um, uh, like lots of people have said, it's kind of, um, it's always changing. Um, but again, with regards to gender, I think I have on my first feature that I'm working on at the moment, um, that's about ageing. And I think I've thought a lot about um, the look of, um, of older women and what we used to on film. So that, that's been in my mind. Well, um, yeah, I think I have to say the same thing about my aesthetic. It changes from film to film, um, basically depending on the subject matter that I choose. I think uh, one thing that all my films have in common, which I can say, uh, looking back at this film, which is one of my first films I've ever done, is that I'm probably not really interested in the mundane. I kind of like to take things out of context and make them a bit more just like to interpret them the way that I'd like to see them, the way that I'd like reality to be, and um, rather than having it like it is. <laughs> We've all sort of alluded to a certain extent to a kind of subtle need for rebel. Oh, we've alluded it to it subtly. That's because we don't want to peak too early, really. Um, but, you know, we, we're, we're talking about um, uh, a reality that we all work to, men and women, which is, is created as the reality, when in fact it's only one version of a reality, but you know, women are educated to think that, that uh, there are rewards for uh, quite a rigid construction around femininity, and possibly men too, and um, you know, how do we feel about that? Does it serve? I don't know if anybody wants to jump in and say how they've been affected by what they've watched. Um, you know, certainly, Sarah, you talked about just wanting to promote a different kind of femininity. Uh, did, did you feel, when you were looking around for representations of women, and let's, you know, let's get straight to the heart of the matter, uh, we're at London Fashion Week, where women are represented over and over again, uh, and yet they are identical, and yet they look as though they are all on a runway conveyor belt, for femininity, there is no diversity. Um, certainly race is something that comes up as where is the diversity, age, size, uh, where, um, you know, femininity is kind of multifaceted, is it not? Is that something that's important to you? Just because um, I made a film about a female bodybuilder and obviously it was a very important thing to me to show a different type of beauty and to explore different types of femininity and um, with that film also the idea of why strength or why muscles for women is considered something that is not socially acceptable or not sexy or not feminine and um, I kind of feel that what you obviously see every day doesn't really represent a, a lot of women. I, I mean, not saying that, like, kind of, for instance, muscles represent what a, a women should be like, but it definitely shows a different type of woman, and that is something that is very important to me. And I feel that often when I work like commercially, I am restricted, and I feel that I find myself in situations where I'm having to um, modify women so that they fit the norm or what people want to see, and I find that really appalling. And I find it's hard to be part of, to be honest. And that presumably is one of the compromises that um, lots of creatives feel. Is that something that anyone else has experienced? Go on, dive in there. I tell you, it's going to be over quicker than you know. <laughs> I definitely think in some of my um, television work, uh, in retrospect, I think I was guilty of kind of, a, of uh, I don't know, going along with a certain kind of object objectification of women. I don't think, I, I don't think it's a just because you're a female director, you're not guilty of it. Um, but definitely as I've got older, I just wanted to question it. I think it is a kind of hard, sometimes if you're, for me, definitely with drama, it's dependent on the script. Um, it's hard to know how to challenge it, but um, I, I think there's a desire to see different people. So it's there, it's just um, making sure you just don't uh, take an easy option. We worked with um, 450 students for Diversity Now last year across 34 colleges and we asked every single student 
whether they thought seeing a more diverse range of role models when they were growing up would have improved their self-esteem, and 92% said yes. So there is enormous power for image makers um, to recognize that um, there isn't one community of women who are hypersexualized, available for sex at all times, scantily clad, submissive, and eager to please. That is a type of femininity, but it's not the femininity. Is that sort of something that you feel um, in wanting to recreate different types of femininity? You're really up against and you know any minute that now if we don't kind of get some fireworks going i'm going to have to start talking about miley cyrus and Robin <laughs> Pitt. so <laughs> so um you know my my question to you is whether you feel you're trying to uh you know progress in a way that is uh, aesthetically ethically and morally more supportive of women um, i think i mean when i was younger the whole uh, i can see how it affects the self-esteem of young girls you know to see a sort of standardized form of this is beauty and you know if you don't match those ideals and you're not beautiful but then from a sort of filmmaker's perspective in my 20s what shocks me really about the whole you know idolized standard portrayal of what beauty is in mainstream is that it's just really boring you know and I think that was the first thing that made me want to do um, something else I think the moral and the ethic um, reasons behind it they came with it but my initial instinct why I wanted to put because I've done this film you know, where I put a 55-year-old nude model in it and she was dressed in latex and very, you know, sexualized clothes and it wasn't because I wanted to do a big sort of more message, it was more because I thought, you know, I'm, I'm presenting latex clothes. If they are worn by a 17-year-old, it's just not believable. So I wanted a woman that was more sexually liberated and strong and powerful. I don't think, you know, a thin, tiny 17-year-old model could do the same thing. Why then, throw the cat amongst the pigeons, does that seem to be the offer permanently for women to look at from mainstream image makers? Go on, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't know, it's really hard, I think, for me to talk about other people's work. I don't, I don't know, I think it's really hard. I mean, Personally, for myself, what I'm offered up as a woman, not as part of my job as a filmmaker, I tend to sort of not really look outside into that world, if I can, if possible, and look at paintings instead, or cartoons. Not, go, not cartoons directed for young girls, because I think they're really, really wrong, and kind of like the Miley Cyrus ma magic power short skirts, big boobs, which is completely wrong. But when I make films, I don't think about femininity. I think about power. And I don't want a power that's greater than a man. I want equal power. And every time I make a film, that's what I try and convey. And I think it's something that's here. Because I have a really sexist father. <laughs> so <laughs> it's always been here. And I've always, that's always been my message. And it's, hopefully will always be my message, but it's not something that's overtly, aggressively stronger than a man, it's just equal and powerful and not feminine. I don't know, I don't know, I have issues with that word feminine, because it's more about strength and power that I try and strive for, but I don't, I don't know how looking at the outside world affects me or my work, I don't really know. I mean, I wonder whether, and I don't know who wants to jump in on this, whether to a certain extent women have been so destabilized by seeing imagery um, of themselves, and the easiest way to brainwash someone is to show them repeat imagery or a repeat situation over and over again. Um, so that, you know, we have a situation where the, uh, most of the imagery that comes out of London Fashion Week is Caucasian. Um, and so we show uh, a reality, um, a reality, um, that is uh, mostly cast by Caucasian casting agents, photographed by Caucasian photographers and starring Caucasian models, but in a global marketplace where the consumer is global and diverse. Does that serve the industry? You know, wh where are we questioning that? And I, I suppose I'm, I'm sort of being um, provocative here and saying, why aren't 
we questioning that female viewers need uh, a lot more um, uh, intentional uh, appro approaches around femininity and the diversity of femininity when they're given so little uh, currently in mainstream image making. Um, does that, you know, Ruth, I'm, you were saying that you don't think about it, you don't have to come back to me on that, but um, I'm wondering why we don't think about it more and harder. I think it is because we're just so used to it. And then the thing is, is like, it's not like, well, I have to come back to my commercial work. It's not like I'm not trying to subvert it in a way and um, consciously choose other types of women. But it is, I'm constantly confronted with, no, this is too ethnic. Or um, even if you cast, like I, I had a situation where I cast dancers that all had very curvaceous bodies and I was told to make them thinner. And I was kind of thinking, well, if you cast dancers for the ability to dance, they have a certain body type, why, you know, I was trying to fight this, but I didn't have the power to. Like, kind of, I felt that I was, the position that I was in didn't allow me that. And I think that that is um, a big thing, is that we're working within an industry that is built like that to generate money, and because it is, a certain unachievable kind of ideal of femininity that we're presented with in order to buy products, in order to, to strive to be a certain way um, that that industry works. So I guess that when confronted with other ideas or with people going like, well, why can't we switch that up? They don't really want that. And it's not, you can try, but sometimes it's not in your power to change that. Um, and uh, so I suppose I'm looking, then wondering what it takes for there to be a cultural shift. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not looking for instant revolution, but how do we um, shift it? Uh, how do we budget, shove it, you know, crash through it? I think actually starting with conversations like we're having tonight, I think actually getting everybody in one room and expressing experiences everybody's had and how appalled they are with them is the beginning and um, trying to um, raise awareness that this is the restraints that are put on female image makers and the kind of requests that come from clients aren't, um, aren't acceptable really for this day and age and how we want to represent women as women and I think it's just keep chipping away and it's going to take a long time but if you keep going and keep going and keep saying no it's going to eventually have to shift and I think um, Going back to what you said about the music videos, I mean, I don't know what the rest of you think and we were talking about it, maybe doing a show of hands later, but you know, there's about five films that came out this summer that really left me cold and sad and furious. And um, you know, name all, them. Name them. Well, well you all know them, but yeah, the Miley Cyrus, I mean, what the hell? And um, I find that is tropical Richard Kern one incredibly upsetting, especially as the girls deliberately look under 16, maybe. maybe. Has, has everyone seen that one? Is it worth explaining that one? Because I, until you showed me the link, I hadn't seen it. I hadn't seen it. Um, well, it's, it's it is tropical, you're a great band, but they are performing in like a dingy um, basement surrounded by, I'd say, 25 girls, all wearing American apparel style C3 underwear or no underwear. Um, dancing around guys who look like they're in their mid thirties and frolicking with them, and it's just altogether a bit sad. You know, it made me feel really uncomfortable and sad. And there's that, and then what else did I send? Yeah, <laughs> the, the, um, the the infamous Robin Thicke. Oh, the Robin Thicke. Party Thick, I mean, sluts. For goodness sake, yeah. I mean, I don't even know what to start <laughs> with it, really. That's directed by a woman, though. That's directed by a woman, and that's why this conversation is important because I think, as you know, the desensitization of women has become so extreme that women themselves are actually playing along with it, and that's where it needs to stop because that's it's a terrible video that has upset an awful lot of people and it's such a bad representation of women as objects and nothing more and yeah it's, it's amazing that this type of work is still getting made in 2013. Amanda? Well I just, I, I completely agree but it's really interesting I thought the comment from Zana Hadid about the fact that she always described herself as a, an architect not a female architect, I, that really resonates with me and kind of I always think of myself as just a director and it, it's um, it's taken me a while to start looking at kind of female issues in my film because 
to begin with, it was about making films. Um, and, and I think that there's always a danger that because we are fem female directors that we should be addressing this, um, but it's definitely for all filmers to look at. So. No, I think that's a good point. I think there's a, another point that I want to pick up on, which I think, um, Alicia, you made, or maybe it was Maria, um, that when you go for a, a pitch, that uh, quite often the room um, is, uh, includes only one woman and the rest are all masculine ideas and a woman is expected to represent everything there is in femininity um, whereas uh, the masculine ideas are given uh, lots of diversity which of course would be the same with race which I think is important to remind ourselves you, you hear it on the news all the time the black community as though there is one community, lots of different white communities, um, and that's something uh, for us all to be aware of, is that there are you know, many, many diverse opinions, and maybe being upfront about that is the first thing that we can do um, you know, as women, being entitled to have lots of different opinions. Maria? Um, no, yeah, that is a point that I've been actually talking to with Catherine and Alicia, and, um, We've, we've figured out that it's, um, especially Alicia, you pitch a lot, and um, I think Catherine as well now, like, um, that when you pitch for an idea, there are a lot of, you know, like basically 20 people are pitching, and then they've got those two or one women, woman that is pitching, and she's representing the female perspective of a filmmaker, but in the end of the day, she's obviously representing an individual perspective. There is no female perspective. That is an idiotic thing to say. Yeah, I don't even know how they got to the conclusion that every female filmmaker is doing the same thing. I mean, just by watching those films earlier or by seeing us in the line, we do all completely different things and our aesthetics are completely vary and that should be a given. I mean, I don't even understand why people still question that. It's ridiculous. In terms of way forward, uh, you certainly work with lots of young filmmakers, uh, Catherine. I don't know if others do too, but, but how can we encourage the next generation of creatives not to take on this kind of set mindset? I think just trying to show as many alternatives um, you know, as possible, really. I mean, I work as a lecturer um, at London College of Fashion one day a week, and I uh, do a film project with lots of students there and you know I just really try to make them aware of what we're talking about here and it's amazing too how quickly students will just regurgitate all of the work um, you know over and over again and it's you know you're also trying to show them new ways of looking at fashion and I think fashion as a as a medium is actually changing so rapidly right now anyway with the internet and um, everything moving online. I just think we're in this fantastic time to really just shake it up. And um, as I said earlier, you know, with fashion film in particular, it's, I would say it's about 70% uh, female in terms of directors, which is unheard of in terms of uh, general filmmaking. So I think it's a chance to really try and push forwards with that and fashion imagery in general. And, you know, if we're all sitting here saying we want to do something, we'll Let's do it. <laughs> I think working for show studio, we like the main part of the films that are coming in are by female filmmakers. I think that also, I think now is a great time for female filmmakers to sort of just do what the hell they want to do. Because when I studied film, which was like whatever, ten years ago now, or eight years, I studied television, and it was a very clear hierarchy, and you had to sort of fit into that. So I think it's much easier to sort of, without even realizing, go with the formality of it. But nowadays, you know, the, the things shifted around, you know, it's not a big company with a film team of 30 people anymore. You can do a fashion film on your, with yourself, you can do it on an iPhone, or you can do it with just having a great idea and, and you know, going out in the fields and filming a friend. And because it became so much more accessible, I think a lot of very young filmmakers who just have great ideas, they can very easily produce something. So I think because the whole setup is shifting and fashion film is you know, a very modern invention of the whole internet culture, I think that's why there are a lot of female filmmakers as well as male filmmakers. There's just a variety. Um, I mean, we have clearly have a situation which editorially there's some amazing imagery coming out from a much more diverse, a much more diverse perspective. But then we hit up against um, the co co commercial, the client, who uh, quite often is not aware of their own um, uh, uh, kind of requirements when they're casting. So when they begin to cast femininity or they begin to cast 
a crew. How do you feel that that's a space that can be um, challenged uh, in a way that is uh, uh, allows for progress? I think that's hard, but you can try. <laughs> I think that it's, it's the thing when money comes into play and. Uh, when people have certain ideas and you're employed to do something specifically, then you can try and open that up and you can kind of present alternatives, but it, at the end of the day, it's unfortunately not in your power to choose that last model, or, uh, or at least that is my experience uh, with the commercial world, but um, you can try. No, I agree. I'm just wondering whether, and I'm, I'm using my own experience a little bit, where we've gone in with research. We took um, research from the Judge Business School at Cambridge University, which was three years of cultural, cross-cultural research um, uh, done by Dr. Ben Barry to prove uh, in business conditions that when women are shown more diversity and role models that they feel uh, they can make a connection with, they are more likely to display an intention to purchase. And that's a kind of business language that motivates the people in charge. Um, I just wonder whether there is a space in which um, filmmakers can begin to gather that sort of argument that you know promotes um, you know their, their, the the empathy that women are able to feel when they are cast not as the hypersexualized party slut um, but maybe somebody who has an interior who is not viewed as an exterior that that moves them towards more loyalty for the brand for the product um, and that may be a space that allows for uh, more shift. I don't know. Did I just say something that seemed wholly unreasonable there? Mm -hmm. No, I think it's, it's about being brave as a filmmaker. And, and I, this is not this issue, but it's, sort of, it's a similar thing. Um, about a year ago, I turned down a television um, series because I felt the scripts were too violent. Um, and I didn't go in and interview for them. Um, and then the show came out and there was quite a lot of criticism. And then when the second season came, I went and, and met and kind of said what I would have liked to have done. And they said, why didn't you come in for the, the meeting? And I, and I think, I mean, everyone wants a kind of a more diverse, interesting kind of, uh, kind of group of films being made. So I think it's about sometimes being brave about the conversation. Absolutely, sometimes there's, there is opposition to that. But uh, I think the more conversations are had about it in, in those um, commercial arenas, the better, definitely. Is there room to just outright challenge? Yeah. Well, I mean, just going even back to the Selfridges film that we showed with um, Karen, who's in it, um, that was commissioned as a fashion film. And, you know, when I was brought in to meet the creative team, it was very much like we want to do a fashion film around female tailoring. And they were also planning this huge female initiative in the store, and it just made a lot of sense to then go back and say, well, how about we actually don't just make a standard fashion film, how about we have amazing women who speak <laughs> and can talk about incredible things that they've done while wearing the bespoke. And the creative team at Selfridges are an amazing bunch of amazing women and they were 100% behind it and were fantastic clients. And I just think, you know, it's about just, I think it's worth always just saying what you're thinking because a, a lot of commissioners and clients are women. And when you do reach out and say, well, actually I'm thinking this might be, more appropriate or maybe more diverse, a lot of them will listen and I'm finding that more and more this year. I think there's just a huge wave of, um, of these conversations <coughs> happening across both you know, the creative side and the commissioning side, so I think it's exciting. I think, I also think, you know, there is, there are places where you can still represent a woman that isn't just this, this standardized sort of, you know, a woman that walks down the catwalk and you know, I've been watching those films that is living proof for it like filming proof because I mean if you look at Ruth you know like she's been you know presenting a woman in all those Gareth Pugh films that is not the sort of like little sweet girl she's very powerful and she at least for me she's very powerful and she's very strong the same with you know Catherine Ferguson's film I think if you approach the right designers and the right you know clients you can get there and you can talk to them because in the end of the day I think even the designers that have the sort of standard woman in their films, they sort of want to touch on the powerful and the more daring, the more complex woman, but I think they're just afraid because it's, it's not safe. And I think that's where the problem lies. So the bigger the company, 
you know, the more you might run into problems, you know, what Alicia has been saying. But if you go to the really amazing, avant-garde, forward-thinking, great designers like Gareth Bue, like Alexander McQueen was, like all those designers that have been presenting more complex women, you know, you can still, you can still do something beyond the standard picture. So I, I don't think, you know, we should just stand here defeated and say it's just not possible, because I think that it is, you just have to really work on it. Rousing talk, we're all with you. Oh, we're so up for it. Um, and I thought it'd be good fun to just take a straw poll, a show of hands, um, to ask whether uh, you, whether you feel as creatives, we have responsibility uh, within our own industry to audit ourselves, whether that involves creating or adhering to some kind of ethical code that at the very least prevents sexual exploitation and objectification of young women in the media and workplace. I don't know whether that's something that lands for you, but I'm just wondering whether you feel that as creatives, that should be the very first thing we start thinking about in projections of femininity. Um, so I'll just ask that nice and simply. Um, <laughs> so that could I have you, could I ask you to put your hands up if you agree that we could personally um, be implementing a moral code that stops sexual exploitation. We're just thinking about the Miley Cyrus video there or um, some of those. Is that, can I have a show of hands? Is that a yes? People would like um, to see that. So that's kind of pretty much unanimous. Um, anybody brave enough to say they don't agree with that? Um, so, so just for the record then, that's unanimous, unanimous. As creatives, we would like to see some boundaries imposed in the projection of femininity. Maybe we would like more authenticity and we would like more diversity. Um, and on that note, um, ladies and gentlemen, that's the very same um, question that a brand new collective of men and women asked themselves 40 years ago. Back then they called it feminism. I wonder what you will choose to call it now. Uh, but I would like you to join with me and thank our panelists. Yes, I think a little ripple of applause. Thank you so much.